Hi, Sabrina. Welcome to the Hello. online workshop. Hello. You are the first. <laughs> I'm early. Yes, you are. And um, did you want me to wait until 11 so you can prepare? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. And uh, while we wait for everyone, yeah, just want to make sure that you have some paper towel, uh, maybe extra cup, you know, if you want to mix um, more colors and then um, Q-tips uh, that can help when we do the blending. Um, water, yeah. A cup of water. Yeah, this is how I have my water is kind of like in a smaller jar. Yeah, that will help me pour it into the palette. And then this one to rinse my brushes. Okay. Okay, let me grab that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. Hello, Carson. Welcome. Hello. hello. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, me too. <laughs> this is quite an early uh, session for me. Usually, my class, my online class is at 4 p.m. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, but this is great. Uh, you know, at least the house is a little quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then after this, I have a uh, in-person uh, class uh, that I teach at a local brewery. So oh, I'll cool. head to that class after our class. Yeah. Oh my gosh, exciting. <laughs> a busy day. Yep. <laughs> it is, it is. Yep. And I'm going to take some of the attendance as we see more people coming in. Uh, Sabrina is already here. And, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't tell from your picture. Do the other cups mm -hmm. also have water in them or no? Um, um, I have like a smaller jar and a big jar. So the smaller okay. jar is going to help me pour into the palette because otherwise I'm going to have a gush of water flowing Got out. It. So I think uh, prepare like a smaller jar or a tiny little cup, yeah? to do okay. that or you can do it with a spoon yeah okay. or you can get fancy with this uh, you know like a dropper like this oh <laughs> but that's not necessary <laughs> i think a spoon or even a smaller cup can you know uh, be helpful and you can also grab make sure you have paper towel yeah and an extra cup if you want to mix um you know, more uh, colors. This is a design that you're going to be painting, Corson. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, the bird of yes. paradise. Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited. It looks so mm -hmm. pretty. <laughs> Even white, it looks so pretty. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, wait until we transform that fabric with colors, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, give, I'm going to give it to my mom for her birthday this summer. So oh, I let her exciting. pick which one she liked. <laughs> That's even more special. Now you really feel the pressure to do a good job. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't do a a, a poor job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are in good hands. <laughs> oh. Welcome, welcome uh, to my uh, online workshop, Candle. 
And I see Sabrina joined us with the video as well. That's awesome. Okay. okay. Should we be putting the colors in the... Mm -hmm. Not not yet, not yet. Um, I think in the usually in the beginning part of the class, I um, introduce you to the tools and the material. Um, I have another camera set up here that uh, when I do the demo on how I apply the hot wax, you'll get to see some of the setup here. So this is my skillet. Yeah, uh, what you see here is the hot wax. So I kind of want to take you into like a short, uh, maybe five minutes to 10 minutes intro on what Batik is about. And then you get to see, you know, some of the tool that I use that comes from all over the world. So it's not just limited to Malaysia. Huh? So, and I have a brush here too. And the idea is to really give you a, you know, a big picture of what Batik is as a, an ancient art, but also a resist technique. And then we're going to do the painting together. So I'll, you know, uh, guide you step by step. Um, the thing is, when we are working with the fabric dye, it's such a fine powder. So I kind of want to guide you through that whole process. All right, so we have more people joining in. I'm going to be taking the attendance here. So <laughs> mm -hmm. watch me. <laughs> I know. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to my online workshop, Sophia, Kendall, Crush Me. Yeah? If you can connect with us today uh, with the video, that would be awesome because I do love to give you feedback yeah, when you paint. And there you are. Hello. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let meet uh, Kathy, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is here. He is under the meeting support. So in case I have <laughs> something that you know happen, yeah, uh, yeah, he's here to help us sort out uh, any technical issues. And we have Karen joining us as well. Awesome. Uh, while we wait for uh, more, yeah, you know, the rest of the group to join, uh, I want to make sure that you have the supplies that you need. Yeah? Uh, a good amount of paper towel, yeah, always helpful. And then uh, Q-tips, yeah, uh, that help when we do the blending. Because I only send you two paint brushes. So Q-tips is actually very helpful to not only help you with transferring the color into the fabric, but when we do the blending, uh, you know, that's a, a great, uh, you know, extra tools to have. And then a um, cup of water. Um, the way I set it up is I have a small cup here, a small jar to help me pour it onto the palette. And then this one is for me to rinse my brush. Okay, so I would advise that you grab something smaller, even a spoon to kind of help you when you want to pour the water onto the palette. It's much easier than, you know, pouring it out of a big jar or a big cup of water. Okay, and let's see. We have, uh, <laughs> all right, yes, crush me. Go ahead and grab the extra cup. And those extra cups can also be helpful when you want to mix extra colors too, because in your palette, you only have space for six, yeah? But uh, even though yeah, I only send you guys four fabric dye, um, I'm going to be guiding you guys how to create rainbows of colors. Um, let's see. Jesse is here. Kevin, Sophia, hello everyone. Welcome to my online class. Just taking attendance of everybody here quickly. Okay, I'm gonna pass the paper to Jonathan. It will be easier as you guys are joining so quickly. It's hard for me to go through. You have it digitally? Awesome, thank you. So the first segment of the class yeah, is really to introduce you to what Batik is. Huh? Um, so I want you to get to know some of the tools that I use to apply the hot wax onto the fabric. And then um, we're gonna spend about 60 minutes yeah, um, painting together. And then at the end of the class, yeah, very quickly um, before I end the workshop, 
I want to show you how to remove the wax. So as you know, you know batik is a process. Yeah, uh, it begins with you know a sketching, making a sketch of you know design that you want to do on the fabric, and then follow up with the janting process. Why apply the hot wax? Yeah. Uh, drip by drip because it has to flow out of the spout of this chanting tool that I use. And then, you know, now we're collaborating together where you apply the pigment and you get to do the fun part. Yeah, the less frustrating part. And um, there's a lot of therapeutic value in, you know, um, in engaging in that painting process. I think, you know, we are so distracted with deadline and news and all kind of crap out there. So to be able to just spend 60 minutes to slow down and, and get your brain to really focus on details, this delicate process of applying, you know, fabric dye pigment on the cloth uh, is very relaxing. So, you know, our goal today is just not to get overwhelmed, not to get stressed out, is to relax. And one of the things that you're going to hear me say a lot is to slow down. Um, you know, the idea is, you know, take 60 minutes out of your, you know, uh, schedule uh, to slow down. And I think, um, uh, you know, I don't want you guys to rush to have to finish the, the piece today. Yeah, so the goal is I'm going to guide you through the whole process, you know, to mix the color, how to remove the wax, so you can take your time, you know, when you finish, you finish, okay, and uh, in a class like this, I always feel like I have so much to share, because I have so many different classes that I teach as far as batik is concerned, it's very, it's a deep world, you know, uh, what you're doing is only one aspect of batik, yeah, it's like the simplest uh, form. Uh, to batik, but there's so many more. Yeah, so hopefully I get to, you know, um, cover that as well. Okay, now I think we have uh, let, uh, Mary and Jonathan. And um, Carson, uh, if during this uh, session you guys want to, you know, interact and do some kind of socialization among you guys, you know, we can do that. Okay, so I just need somebody to kind of like maybe, I don't know, uh, get the group to, you know, um, uh, chat or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's up to, to you guys. Okay, there will be time for that, even though it's like only 60 minutes. All right, so it's 2 or 7 now. I like to start on time. So whoever joined us will catch up. Okay, all right, we're good, everybody. Uh, Sophia, Mary Ann, yeah. Uh, see, I have people on yeah. page two as well. Uh, MC, I have someone. Kendall, if you guys could connect yeah with the video as well, that would be wonderful. I do love to give you feedback, yeah. Uh, as we do the paint uh, process. All right, so welcome everybody. <laughs> A quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Munira Reimer. You can call me Muni. Uh, or Munira, and uh, I am originally born and raised in Malaysia. Um, I came to uh, Miami as an international student in 1994, and uh, here I am. Uh, uh, Miami has been my home in the last 20 years, and I've been teaching batik um, throughout South Florida uh, in the last uh, five years, but I started to team up with Airbnb, where I am one of the uh, Airbnb experience host in the last uh, three years. So my more popular class is the batik scarf painting class. That is how it kind of like put me on the map with the Airbnb community and the travelers, the people that come to visit Miami. But then during the pandemic, everything come to stop and I had to pivot my business uh, to be able to um, keep keep going regardless of what happened. So we shrunk the scarf into the handkerchief that you have in front of you. Yeah? And then we used the hoop to make it easier, lighter for us to ship all across the country. And I don't know how many online workshops I have done, but I think it's got to be close to a hundred online workshop um, since we started uh, last year on Mother's Day. So 
I'm very excited to be able to share my passion, but also my cultural heritage with all of you today. Okay, so what is batik? Batik is an ancient art. It's a form of a resist technique. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with tie-dye. Tie-dye, we tied it. So wherever we tie it, that become the resist, right? So then we got all this random, beautiful, abstract uh, you know, color on, on the t-shirt. But here, yeah, I apply by hand and, you know, the, the hot wax. So the hot wax allow us to paint in the shape of the image, flowers or mandala or, you know, um, uh, so the wax, yeah, stop the color from bleeding out. So that way we can paint the area. But, yeah, like I explained earlier in the beginning, but it is a process. Uh, it begins with me stretching the fabric, yeah, tracing, applying the hot wax, and then we collaborate together yeah, where you get to paint. And then we have to finish the project by removing the wax. So at the end of the class, yeah, you will learn how to remove the wax from the, your fabric. So your process is complete. Okay, uh, it's a slow fashion art. Yeah, from the time I apply the wax to you painting, where you spend another 60, maybe I have students painting it for three hours when they're really delicate and slow with the process. And then you get to let it dry and then you remove the wax. So more time. Yeah, so if we don't finish the class today, don't worry, don't get overwhelmed. Yeah, it's uh, let's go slow and then enjoy the therapeutic value in, you know, um, you know, batiking. So what you have in front of you is already pre-waxed, yeah? It looks like this. I have a different design than you guys, yeah? So um, uh, let's see. Now, the goal is to create a hand-painted piece like this. Yeah? This is hand-painted. Um, we call this a washable piece because the color is fixed with the soda ash. So if you look in your packet, you receive like a white powder called soda ash, and that is sodium carbonate. It's the same family as baking soda. What it does, yeah, the soda ash, and I'm gonna get into it a little detail when we start painting. Uh, what it does is it activate the pigment that you apply to bond to the fiber so the color stay onto, in the cellulose permanently. And that is kind of how a traditional batik is done. So the ash is very important yeah, in batiking because it makes sure that the color pigment that you put in bond permanently to the cellulose on the fiber so it becomes washable like this. Okay, now um, on your reference sheets, I did give you guys option. It's like in the chart, the left and to the right, they are washable and also decorative. In the decorative piece, you will not be using the soda ash, okay? So we'll skip the soda ash part if you're doing a decorative piece, but you can see the color is so different. So I want you to make that call whether you want your batik to be traditional, where it's washable. And this is more example of washable piece. You can see the color is more subtle, yeah? Compared to, look at this, yeah? And this, the color is more subtle compared to decorative piece where the color is not fixed. Now we need to tell the, we need to tell the different, why do we have to learn these two ways to batik? Because if let's say you love the vibrant color to stay on your fabric, yeah? um, to at the end, you're not gonna remove the wax by boiling water, like a traditional batik piece is done. You're gonna iron it, which I will show it to you how to do that. The heat from the iron will melt the wax. The wax will get absorbed on the paper towel, leaving you a printed in you know, a design like this on your fabric. Okay? Cannot get, cannot touch water, nothing. Because the color is not fixed. It's really meant for you to display, yeah? Or put it back in the hoop, for example. But it's not meant for you to wear. So either way, we can do it and I'll guide you through that process. Okay? So I just want you to know what to expect in terms of, you know, uh, what we're going to be doing with this fabric. So this is washable piece. And you can see the white line is from the hot wax that is on your fabric now. Okay. 
So once we fix the color, the color bonded permanently to the fiber, we remove it with boiling water, which I will show as well at the end of the class, and leaves you with all this color permanently on the fiber. So in a group like this, I usually have a mix of people that do decorative or washable, okay? And that is totally up to you. And I think a lot of it has to do with lifestyle, yeah? If you don't want to mess up your kitchen or, or it's, if it's, it's too much to do the, the boiling method, it's very easy. Yeah, you'll see, it's super simple. Uh, but you can make that decision after you completely finish the painting process, okay? Now, here's an example of how, can you guys hear me? Can you, okay, all right. So here's an example of how wax, hot wax can be used to create pattern. Yeah, designed on a fiber. And here you can see how the contrast between the white and the blue makes something beautiful compared to this gray here. But yeah, you can see all this line here is done with wax, okay? So the chemistry part, yeah, which I will get into it as we start painting yeah, uh, with the soda ash, yeah, that is important. Anyway, so now let's go into, I'm gonna demonstrate how I apply the hot wax onto the fabric and then introduce you to some of my favorite junting tool that I use. Okay, so here you can see in Munira Reimer camera there, yeah? This is a piece that I was going to propose for an art cam, but I went with another design. So now I can play with this. <laughs> uh, so as you can see here, this is the hot wax, yeah? This is the wax, yeah, pure beeswax. Let me Okay, can you see? Yeah. So pure beeswax and this is paraffin. So I added paraffin to my blend yeah, in, this, uh, in this hot wax here. Paraffin is what allow me to create the crackle that I want on a fabric. Let's say if I do, let's say a piece like this, if you can see it, yeah, uh, on the batik cam. And here, yeah, you can see how the crackle here, yeah, the paraffin in my batik wax is what allow me to crack it easily. And then when I dip it in the color, yeah, the dark color will seep in creating this like a uh, cracker look, which is the essence of what batik is. So I have to add paraffin into here, even though it's not as sustainable as a beeswax. Okay, so how, how I apply this, yeah? So here I am, I'm using a janting tool from Malaysia. Uh, this is a janting tool from Indonesia. This is a janting tool that is used by the Black Hamong tribe in Sapa. Sapa is a beautiful spot, uh, northern Vietnam, uh, southern Thai, aside uh, not southern China. So you can look at how even the tool almost evolved. If you look at how it is from a tribe in the mountain that use almost like a blade like uh, tools like this to apply the wax, yeah to a more evolved where the wax sit in a bowl. Yeah, the bowl is made of metal to be able to contain the heat. So I can you know, carry the wax to the fabric. So here it is, yeah, I'm just scooping it up. And then I usually wipe the bottom of my um, tools here. I don't know if you can see it very well, it's glaring. I know from the lighting here. And then I apply it just like this by hand. Yeah, and I can't go very fast. If I go fast in the process of creating this outline, yeah, the wax will not go or permeate the fiber as good. Yeah, so it's a slow fashion art, truly slow fashion art. Um, how long do I take to finish each of your hoops? I've done thousands of it. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a matter of just sitting here and really get in the zone for me. So I usually spend about uh, 10 minutes on each piece, okay? Um, so that's the, how the wax outline is done. This is just one tool, yeah? I can also go into another tools here, yeah? Black among tools. And uh, I am the only one <laughs> in this country that is able to get to bring uh, some of these tools so other batik artists can also use it as well. This is great to do linear line and geometric pattern. You know, on the fabric because I just dip the metal part, flick, 
and I adapt a little bit. I want to make sure that you can see it. If you're not, you can see it from the, the other camera. Yeah, and I just go like this. So if you look at how some of my line is so precise, that's because I use all this tool to make the production process very easy for me. Okay, so we can also use something like this. This is a stick. This is a bamboo, you know, like a, just a stick. And now I can go into more kind of like random. I can create like a little, you know, um, kind of a sprinkle, you know, just kind of like how we create when we were young. Yeah, when we were kids and we do with our toothbrush, yeah, to get the color to sprinkle on our uh, art pieces is the same thing. Yeah, so instead of using, you know, uh, whatever medium that is, we're using hot wax to create all this design or pattern on the fabric. Okay, so if you look at the back of your hoop, you can touch and you can see how the wax outline, a good wax outline has to permeate the cloth. It cannot just sit on top of the fabric. Yeah, once it's permeate the cloth, that's how you know the line is strong, it's reliable. So when you paint, the color will not bleed out. Okay, so now we get to the best part of painting together. And once we, you know, as we work with the, the fabric dye color, I want you to put aside your hoop, yeah? Put aside your hoop because they are fine pigment. If you have fans blowing, if you have, uh, it can get onto your, your white fabric. So we're gonna take our time to get the color palette started, okay? So I have my big jar here with a lot amount of water for rinsing my brush. And I have a smaller cup here to help me pour yeah, water into my palette, okay? Um, and then I have my soda ash. So the soda ash, oh, I have to change my camera back to my laptop so you can see me. All right, so the soda ash, we don't have to worry about it yet, okay? So we're just gonna deal with the color pigment right now and we're all gonna start the same way, yeah? We are going to pour just a little bit of the color pigment onto the palette, okay? Um, you can use scissors. Did you put, to... sorry, did you put water yeah. in all the pans to start? Uh, not or just yet. A couple? You can either okay. start with the powder first and then we add water. That's probably okay. easier, okay? Uh, so I'm just gonna tab a little bit. Yeah, you really don't need a lot. Um, this is about one six or even very little, yeah? Very little amount of uh, dye. And then we're gonna add a little bit of water and you can see yeah, how just a little bit can really, uh, you know, um, get the kind of color that you want. Um, you may not want to put red next to the dragon fruit or the pink because it will be harder for you to tell that apart what shades is what. So maybe on the other end, you can put your uh, fire red. Hmm? Now, when you create your color palette, this is fire red, this is dragon fruit, and you see how close they are, right? So when you're creating your color palette, whatever color that you plan on using, I want you to create a lighter shades of it or a darker shades of it. So for the color that you want, I want you to have two tones going on light and dark, okay? So why is that important? Because we are painting with fabric dye, kind of like watercolor. I want you to start with a lighter color first and then saturate it and make it darker. So here's my light pink and here's my uh, medium kind of pink. I can make it darker if I want to, but I want to start with something light. And you should be kind of creating a palette that's in that same direction, okay? There will be light color and light shades and dark of the same color. This is my lighter red here. And then let's go ahead and get the blue going too. Yeah? The blue will be important when we want to paint the, you know, the leaves or make green, for example. So the same color theory apply even when we work with you know, mediums like fabric dye. So you can see here, I have a little bit of the blue powder getting into my pink here. So take your time when you prepare your color palette those tiny, tiny little, you know, pigment 
uh, you know, can change um, how your color look. Yeah? Um, let's see. You want to stir and really dissolve those uh, yeah, uh, fabric dye powder. Now, um, I use fabric dye powder that's called fiber reactive dye or Procyon MX. Um, you know, I use two different suppliers. Uh, this dye here comes from the Pro Chemical and Dye on the East Coast. And uh, this is the safest kind of dye to use for home crafters. Um, um, you know, the dye color that is on my shirt, on your shirt, they're more commercial, yeah, commercial dye. Um, that may take different regulation to dispose the wastewater, yeah, uh, in the sink or in the sewer. So, but this type of dye is the safest. So when you're done painting, yeah, and you want to rinse your, you know, palettes or, or you know, it, it can just go in this in the sink, yeah. So you don't have to worry about how it will impact the environment. Okay, it's, it's safe to use. Now I need my yellow here. So see how my palette here, I have light, dark, light, dark going on. So uh, you may need to grab extra cup, yeah, to make more colors. But, um, you know, the painting is a process. Um, maybe you, you know, start with two colors first and you can always make more as you go. Um, I know I only send you guys with two brushes. So if you have Q-tips around the house, yeah, you can use Q-tips to help you do this, you know, um, color palette. Now you can see how even a little bit of the, you know, blue pigment that fly or like, you know, in the airborne and then suddenly appear on your palette that can affect how those primary yellow look. Huh? So. All right, so I have my color going on. My yellow has a little bit of green in it, so I don't mind, no? I'm just gonna be okay with that. And then if you wanna make a purple, for example, yeah, same thing, yeah, same color theory applies. You can mix your pink and your blue together. So I'm gonna try and get that going over here. I want you to take your time to get the color going rather than yeah, <laughs> having to deal with the powder as you paint and I don't want it to get into your white fabric. Okay, so I have my purple here. Um, I like to use the paper towel yeah, to kind of test how the color look. Um, of course, it's not the same as testing this on a fabric, but um, you can see here's my light pink. Here's my darker pink, yeah? And then my light red, my darker red, it's good. Now, um, I'm gonna try and really encourage you guys to just paint with one brush rather than using 10 Q-tips for every color. Uh, how can you paint with just one brush yeah, easily? Uh, you have to remember we are working with fabric dye. So you can just squeeze. You can just squeeze the brush like this. That's kind of like it, it clean it. And then now you can dip into the next color without worrying about contaminating and then end up with some brown because you, you know the color goes everywhere. So, so just squeeze your brush before you dip into the next color. And here's my purple here. So my palette, color palette is ready. How are you guys doing? Good. Good? Good? All right, awesome. I think some of you may have been ready to paint already. <laughs> now, why do we use water? Why don't we make the soda ash solution? Um, I think, you know, the, the concept is for us to all start the same way. We create the dye color pigment, and then we add the pigment to the fabric. And then later on, if you decide to make it, to make a traditional batik, yeah, uh, I'll guide you on how to apply the soda ash solution to fix the color. And if you decided to just make a decorative piece, yeah, you don't have to use soda ash, 
Yeah, but at least you got all the color pigment on the fabric. Okay, so here is my piece here. A little different. I have the toucan, and uh, this is the bird of paradise. I think quite a few of you um, are painting this design, and then we have the succulent mandala so if you and at any point i know you are all very creative at any point if you're like munira i want to look at this sample yeah uh just let me know and i'll i'll bring out some from some of you know my sample here okay all right so there's no right or wrong color huh? as far as what you can do or how you can transform a white fabric like this um like I said earlier, you know, we're going to start with the light color first. So here I'm going to try and, you know, do the leaves here. Um, you can start with the light color on my palette here, which is the yellow. My yellow is not quite yellow. It has a little bit of a, almost like a lime green because my blue got into it and I don't really, you know, it doesn't bother me. And now I add a little blue to it. Yeah? And you can see how easy it is. I'm going to bring it closer. Um, and start again. Uh, here is my not quite yellow, <laughs> my lime green, and then I add a little bit blue to it. And then now, yeah, the interaction of the two colors will allow me to create kind of like a sea foam ish light green that I want. Okay. Uh, now it's such a small area for me to demonstrate how I do the blending, but you can see how. Yeah, you're gonna move your brush kind of like in a circular motion like this to create the blending that you want. And you're gonna go slow with the process. You're gonna dip your brush, dip in the dye, and then dab onto the fabric. Yeah, we're not gonna do this. Yeah, we're not gonna do like the stroke like we would do on acrylic. Remember, you are working with fabric dye on a fiber on a fabric so the moment this fabric dye got into your your you know the the, the cloth is going to spread so fast so you want to kind of do it yeah gently and yeah, delicately you know, dip your brush and then you know dab it onto the fabric so i'm just using one brush because i love how my leaves has a bit of yellowish bluish and greenish in it so i like that um, you know, it's usually up to you how you want to, you know, transform the fabric. Uh, we all express ourselves differently, you know, with colors and whatnot. So it's really up to you, okay? Uh, but the important thing to remember, so always start with the light color first. And then what I mean by that is also that I can always make it darker, okay? So right now, you can see how it's very light. So consider this as the first layer of color, okay? We can always saturate, we can always soak the fabric with more colors. But once, if you start with a strong color already, you cannot reverse that to make it lighter, yeah? Uh, even if you could add water to dilute it, like watercolor, but it's not the same as slowly developing the color by going from light to dark. I say if I want to make my leaves here much darker, I can always add darker blue and then grab more of my yellow and then transform that to make it darker. Like here, you see that? Yeah. So it's important to, you know, in order for you to produce a nice looking batik piece, yeah? start with a light color and then slowly add that saturation and build it up, build up the color. It's kind of like, taking your time to soak the fiber with this pigment. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people I mean, find it very relaxing, but at the same time, I think, you know, in this particular process, you also learn a lot about yourself too, you know, like how, open you are to letting go because sometimes uh, you know there may be a color that bleed out and lying a little bit it's not as perfect but i think you know um, uh, this process of transforming the fabric 
help me to die kind of uh, teach you a little bit of a, a thing or two about you know having to let go a little bit and not focus on you know um, everything being so perfect uh, but you know since we are using fabric dye you can always use a darker color to hide yeah, any boo-boo whatever we can call it yeah any blemishes you can always use darker color that's me right now i'm having trouble starting because uh -huh. Uh -huh. i don't want to okay. ruin <laughs> okay well uh okay so to start i always start in, look at how i start with the area that's closest to me okay so rather than going like this, yeah, you want to start the area closest to you. And then whenever you want to get, you can always turn your hoop around. Because remember, this is fabric dye. You don't want to scrub the dye, right? You want to be delicate with each area that you paint. So my advice is you can start maybe in the center and then expand out. Or you can start with an area that's closest to you. Yeah. But you also want to give yourself room to rest your hand on, on the hoop or on the fabric as well. Uh, if you wear long sleeve, you may want to you know, roll your sleeve so it's not you know, smudging uh, the color. Um, Sometimes I have you know, my client or student that have their bracelet or whatever, and that can get in the way as well. <laughs> If you have one that's in a little color that drip, you know, get out of the line, like I said earlier, um, don't worry. Yeah, I think um, you know, focus on the experience, focus on learning something new rather than making it so perfect. And I know sometimes, you know, the overthinking part is hard to deal with. <laughs> You're overthinking about what color to go where, you know. Um, let it go, let us let it, let it flow, you know, start with one color, one area, and then just let it come, you know, without being too worried about what goes where. And I also like for me, I kind of just listen to my instinct. I think sometimes it's like saying, oh, you know, this color could be better if I make it a bit darker here. And, um, you know, that's usually how I kind of approach the painting process um, I you know sometimes I think it's good to plan how you want the how you want the area to look uh, let's say the bird here how I want it to look it's a good idea to plan um, because then it makes the painting painting process a lot easier um, you know let's say if I were to put let's say a light pink here and then I can always make it more purplish here, you know, or it makes the process of applying the color a lot easier. Yeah. Once you have an idea how you want to transform a specific area. Here, I want to make it a little bit purple, but it's not looking purple now yet. Well, all I have to do is add a little bit of pink on top of it. And then I'm blending the color together where the pink and the blue meet in like a circular motion like this. You kind of like have to imagine it's like you're pushing the color into the fiber so that it blends and it looks softer rather than just having like a streak of color on the fabric. Okay, so that's what I did. I start with the lighter color first. And I bring in the medium pink and then I just add blue and then I start to do the blending. Are you guys having fun? Yes, it's <laughs> very so. yeah. oh everybody God, is so great. everybody is so yeah. quiet. I assume you guys <laughs> are getting in the zone. <laughs> yes. okay. I, I love your mantra, let it be or let it go or the frozen mantra. I know, I know. <laughs> Because I, I teach people how to apply the wax. Um, it's an online class. So I send them this whole tools and supplies. And um, uh, 
you know, I kind of have to explain there's three things that you need to know in the batiking process. Yeah. Uh, number one, patient. You have to have the patient. Yeah. And then number two, you have to practice acceptance. You have to accept, you know, when things are not perfect, maybe we can make it part of the art. And that's where the creativity will come in, yeah? And how you can, you know, um, make a boo-boo and then turn that into something beautiful. Uh, and anything is possible. <laughs> uh, and then I think lastly, I try to make them understand it is a process. Uh, you know, for you guys, um, I hope you, you know, um, find it very therapeutic. Uh, but at the same time, you know, know that you don't have to rush to finish the piece today. I think the longer you're able to extend some of that therapeutic benefits, you know, uh, the better. So well, we're going to color as much as we can. And then, um, you know, I'll proceed. I'll proceed with the wax removal so you know how to do it on your own you know, after you finish painting. But, uh, you know, most of the time when you do batik, just like silk painting, the more delicate you are with the process, I can assure you, the better the result. So you're going to practice slowing down a lot. <laughs> And let's say if you want to make the color darker, what can you do? Um, let's say if it's green, uh, you can add the turquoise. Every time you add turquoise to your lighter green or lime green, it's always going to be darker. Okay. Oh. And then the same thing if you're creating a, a lavender or purple color, um, you know, you mix the blue and the pink, but add more turquoise to that mixture to create a darker, deep purple, for example. Um, what else? Um, how can you make, um, let's see, what other color? Brown, for example. I like to use brown even on the leaves. I think it creates a great depth yeah, uh, and dimension to the piece. Um, I'm going to create here so you can, you know, if you want, you can follow uh, or, you know, just keep in mind. So I'm going to start with the red. I'm going to mix red and the green together. And that's how I'm going to make my brown. Uh, you know, when you deal with the shades of color, a brown can go from ugly brown to like a tan color. And uh, so the first color that you're going to get when you mix green and red together to create your brown is like super ugly brown. But um, yeah, you can always dilute it to make it lighter brown and then add yellow. So when you add yellow to your brown, you can create like a tan color and that's really pretty. You can add that tan color with your yellow and do the blending. And I think it's, you know, such a nice uh, shadings to do. You see how now you can see my palette here. Yeah, I have, this is like the brown shades, the, the, the tan color almost. And then this is the ugly brown here. Okay. So let me see, maybe I can use that on the beak here for my toucan. And you can see it's not quite yellow, it's more like kind of tan color. And then I can bring in my light brown. There you go. Okay. And remember, you're not painting with acrylic. Huh? This is fabric dye. So just go slow because that fabric dye was spread so fast. So common sense. Huh? If you are painting like a small area, yeah, use that small brush. Yeah, don't use the big brush. The best part for me is, I guess, experimenting with mixing colors and see what happens. So, uh, you know, I hope you 
you'll, you know, um, have fun with that. I like yeah. how if you make a mistake, you can just mm -hmm. keep blending until you get the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Because mm -hmm. I thought I messed up, but I just kept uh -huh. blending it with water. And good. It good. <laughs> so, yes, you're going to use water, kind of like watercolor. You're going to use water as a, an agent to kind of make that fabric dry travel a little bit across your fabric. So, um, you know, yeah, water is a good thing to, to get the color to mix yeah, and blend as well. So to get like a more smoother, softer look rather than like a streak on the fabric. How is everybody doing? Let's see. <laughs> I had the same thing, right? I blended in like a purpley brown that was a little bit too dark for the orange uh -huh, that I was working uh -huh. with. But uh -huh. then I just took my little water and did the same thing, just kind of right. smoothed it out. <laughs> And also with the color mixing, when the two color mix together, yeah. Um, let's see if you have uh, pink and then you adding green to it, you're gonna get brown. So kind of maybe test first before you mix two colors together. So you kind of know what to expect when the two colors mix, yeah. Anybody want to show me their progress? Anna, how are you doing? I can see you like enjoying your lunch and painting at the same time. <laughs> this is mine so far. Okay, no, cool. So when you show me if the fabric is still wet, try and show me at an angle rather than 90 degrees because I don't want the color to bleed out, to bleed out, you know, or to run. So uh, just show me at an angle. Very good. Nice. Yeah, keep going. And I see another yeah. mandala, Sophia. Beautiful blending of that pink and purple. <gasps> wow, beautiful. Everyone have a look at the uh, succulent here. We have, I can't see your name on my bar here. Hold on. Crush me? Yes. Beautiful. I love how the dark color that you use there. Was it purple? Was it gray? I kind of just mixed both the reds and a little <laughs> bit of blue and then something new came up. Okay, so it is the shades of purple. Can, yeah, but I like how strong it is. And the, whenever you use lights and dark color together, yeah, it make it pop. And I think uh, that's awesome. Good job. And Sabrina, how are you doing over there? I'm a very tiny. Nice. Sabrina. Good, good, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm just experimenting with colors right now. Exactly, exactly. Now with the succulent, it's kind of, um, you know, like our tendency is to make everything look green or bluish green or grayish green. But, uh, you know, you can have fun with probably introducing some colors. I know, like here, yeah, you can have quite a range from, and you see how I use the light and dark color, yeah? So that's something that you can experiment to make your uh, batik pop a little bit, yeah? And, uh, and you see how even the purple color that I use here, this is a washable piece, so it's much lighter, yeah? The color will appear lighter. But uh, even though it's a washable piece like this here, this washable piece here, look at how the red appear. The red appears so dark. So, yeah, how you get a good, like more vibrant washable piece is going to depend on how strong of a color that you use, okay? Um, if you use very light pastel and then you decided it to be a washable piece and it's very pastel looking, uh, you can be sure that your finished batik piece, once you remove the wax with the boiling water, is going to look like one shade lighter. So that's something to keep in mind as you paint and apply the, you know, um, the color. Uh, if you intended for it this to be a washable piece, go darker. Okay, so.
Jonathan, uh, make sure my water is boiling. So Carson, do the, do you you know how how what are the different I guess online workshop that you guys have done? It's a group. We since COVID, the most recent one we did was a painting party, um, oh, where nice. we like you know one of those like <laughs> wine and paint kind of things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> which was nice and fun. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a step by step thing. And then mm -hmm. what else have we done? Um, we've done cooking classes where like, oh, like nice. Teddy has run cooking classes, yeah. cool. um, to teach us how to make recipes, various recipes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, this, I just, I loved the painting class so much that I wanted to find kind of more opportunities to do similar, similar right. things. And my mom studies, um, spent a lot of time studying textiles in Vietnam. Textile? Oh, cool! And so, so she actually has a bunch of videos of um, mm. boutique artists using that, like Black Mung wow. boutique artists using that um, say straight hi, line. Say, say hi to your mom and tell her that um, I'm also very impressed with how the Black Hmong as a tribe has really found a way to, uh, you know, apply this wax in such a precision manner. And at the same time, they don't have to worry about the blob or, or yeah. how it wax dripping. So it's as ancient as it is. And knowing that they live in the mountains, uh, yeah. they have what a cool way and efficient way to batik. Yeah. yeah. And watching, like she, she did a bunch of documentation when she was there a, few, a couple years ago. Um, mm -hmm. She did a five week trip to Sapa and wow. um, got a ton of videos and stuff. And just watching That's the awesome. artist's work is unbelievable. I love it. Yeah, yeah. And so we are using what we call color fast. Color fast, you know, is cold water dye. And of course, in Sapa or in, you know, northern Vietnam, right, they use the indigo, right? they yeah. use the natural dye in their backyard. And the whole process is so interesting because, you know, if we, if we want dark blue, we just add more to a course and create dark blue. But for them to make the uh, black among batik looking dark blue, they have to dip the fabric in the indigo bath or, or solution 40 times to keep, keep dipping it and then, you know, hang it dry, dip it, hang it dry to develop that color that they yeah, needed. and their, so, their vats mm -hmm. of indigo are like the generational, mm -hmm. like they're passed down as heirlooms, which is exactly I know so right? amazing. It's it's you know it it's funny that hey, you know, what did you get for your wedding? Oh, I got an indigo bath. <laughs> like right. what do you mean indigo bath? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and then I, also the, the yeah. hands, it's like you know, for the artisan or the batik maker, their hand, I don't think ever look like how when they were young, as they age, the color blue just stay on their hand. I mean, like, it's amazing. Um, yeah. And I mean, there were women who were like 75 years old who were hand beating the fabric and hand waxing all the fabric and stuff. Yeah. And they're, you know, it's true, just amazing. True, true. So like, you know, say, think about this, what we do together is just one, let's say one layer, one round of, of you know, process. But to the black among, they can take fabric like this. Yeah, and then they embroider, they embroider and they add other colors on the fabric. So let's say a bride, a bride that was planning a wedding, let's say a year from now, she will start making her outfit, <laughs> like, you know, her bridal gown or, or costume now. And it take a year for her to, 
complete the batiking process and then do the embroidery and then do the beading. So, yeah, what an interesting, you know, and I, I, and I love that you're sharing with me about your mom's journey, yeah, in discovering this textile art. Yeah, pretty cool. I hope to do cool, cool travel stuff like she travels has like to. that. I know. Yeah. And and I and trust me, I think for me as a you know boutique artist, and I'm passionate about it. The travel is what really help um, and allow me to grow, but at the same time, truly understand how social economic has influence in how batik is made around the world. Um, mm -hmm. Sometime, let's say in Africa, when we were in Uganda uh, two years ago, um, they don't have access to beeswax, you know? So they use paraffin right. a lot in their work. And then even trying to get the color is, you know, is, is hard for them. Um, so it's, you know, the travel has definitely been a plus for me to be able to say, hey, you know, here's how we do it the Malaysian way. Oh, here's the story from my travel to Indonesia. Oh, here's, you know, what's going on in Northern Vietnam. And uh, before the pandemic start, like I had booked a trip to Japan to study the Rosomi Batik, which is in Japan, yeah? And um, that got canceled, so hopefully, when things ever get back to normal, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll be able to complete, you know, my dream to add Japan to the list. Yeah, yeah. You may you may have seen batik pieces that's from uh, India. Yeah, batik is also done uh, in Russia. Yeah, but they use the wax to decorate the eggs during Easter. So you may have seen pictures of very delicate looking yeah um i never put that, that together is, that those were the same yeah. it's the same kind of technique same so here is a tool i'm holding it in a batik cam right now it's so different than the tools that i use this is called kiska so this is used in russia the wax go in this tiny little container here and then you have to imagine they say this is eggs in my hand and this is how they decorate it yeah drip by drip from the hot wax that is scooping and you know flew out through the spout. Mm. What I just did a cool like fuchsia you? section. <laughs> <laughs> oh nice Carson look at you. <laughs> Let's have, a, let's have a look again. Carson, bring it, bring it back to the screen one more time. Wow, look at this color. Uh, every time you add a little green to that bird of paradise, it really enhances it because naturally, it's not just yellow, orange, or red. There's always a pin of green if you really look at you know, how the bird of paradise looks. So good job. <laughs> how do you make orange? How do um, we make orange, yellow and red? You can do yellow and dragon fruit, but you'll get a better outcome if you go yellow and red together. So we know when I color like I, and I hope you figured it out by now already that like you go section by section. I think that's the easiest to deal with the color. Let's say if you just start here and then you go there, you leave the color here to dry. When you come back to add more color, that color is not gonna move as much. So if you go area by area, yeah, it's much better approach than, you know, going all over and then revisit some of the old section and then try to repaint it. You'll see the color just sit there and it doesn't wanna move as much. And of course, yeah, at any time, if you want to darken the color, yeah, like here, this color here could be darker. And remember, you have that extra color in the bag. You have a lot of extra color. And you can always, yeah, add more saturation. So the higher, the more pigment you add, 
as, as opposed to water, yeah? um, the darker, uh, the, the, the color that you'll get. Now be careful, yeah? here's an example of how <laughs> I got a boo-boo because I just parked my brush, put my down, and then it got to the side of my fabric here. So, uh, you know, for me, uh, I can bleach this to, in order to keep my fabric all white, I can bleach that. So um, I would recommend it to you if it's like in this area here, you can do it, but do it cautiously because when you apply bleach here, you know, of course the color will disappear, right? But you may have to reapply the color. Yeah? And uh, so if that happened to you and it bothers you, especially on the edge like this, you could yeah, take a little bit of the bleach and then just use your brush and, and, and rub that against the boo-boo there and that will go away. Now I'm making it darker. So I'm applying this darker blue here and just go like that. And now if you feel that the color is too much, yeah, you can use your Q-tip. So I'm just using my paper towel here and I'm just rubbing the color at the same time, kind of like spreading the color where I want it to be and just using my paper towel here. Okay. Because we don't have white, the process of keeping a certain area light yeah, and not too dark, I think is one of the fun challenge that we have to face when we paint. yeah. Because if you put too much dark color, that white area will disappear. So you have to, you know, delicately, you know, um, know that, okay, I this is too much. And then, you know, if you have to dab away some color, you'll do that, yeah? Grab your paper towel you can dab away some color. We are doing good on time, ladies. Um, we're gonna keep painting until about, let's see, uh, 3.10 or 3.15. And then I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you guys how to remove the wax, okay? Uh, just keep in mind, you don't have to finish it today, yeah? But it's good to know what to do after, yeah, after your batik piece dried. Um, I'm going to go ahead and paint on this piece here that I have. And then I'm going to use this piece to iron. So I'm going to quickly just add color here. I too get very quiet when I get in the zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm vibing. I know. I'm like, okay, focus, focus. <laughs> mm
Oh my gosh, this looks so cool. <laughs> it's just like the way the the way the pigment kind of flows is just so different exactly. to anything else I'm exactly. used to. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's relaxing because you're not worrying about designing. You mm -hmm. are having fun watching the color take over the fabric slowly and slowly. And then not just that, you can change it. You can enhance it when you make the lighter, darker blending, all that mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> It also is fun to paint with just the same brush and just rinse it off because sometimes you I get know. color caught up in it and then. I know. So yeah, I am definitely a, a, you know, an advocate with just like painting with one brush. I like how easy for me to work and um, it's just much easier than having one brush for every color. And I also sometimes like when I just see this unpredictable color just show up on, on the fabric. I right. like that. I like that as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I didn't mean for there to be blue there, but oh, that kind of looks But nice. it looks pretty. <laughs> exactly. I dig it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I dig it. That's good. <laughs> I can stay. I like how you do not have to worry about boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because <laughs> it is, it, it helps the, you know, yeah, that's the, the wax outline. And um, let's say in the janting process, yeah, because I'm not machines, I'm human. Uh, if my line does not connect properly, yeah, um, there may be possibilities that the color bleed out a little bit. Yeah, uh, so you know if that happened, I apologize. Cause that can happen. Yeah, the, if the line does not connect, that can happen. If the line is too thin, that can happen. But it also can happen from you know uh, where you place your brush. Yeah. So um, I think a lot of the you know some of the process like I explained earlier. Yeah, uh, acceptance and also kind of <laughs> you know of uh, being okay with with you know using the creativity yeah to hide mm -hmm. some of the imperfections and I think we all do that <laughs> in life <laughs> like when we apply makeup right <laughs> Good we have a little <laughs> a little blemish it's like oh, nobody has to see that we can take care of this you know yeah so I'm trying to make a grayish, like darker color here. So, you know, if you want to do that, it's just mi mixing all the primary color. You know, I just mix the green and the red and the purple and the blue together. And, and um, that's what you can do. Let's see, I think it's, it's okay. You know, the shades that you get, the color that you get really depend on the ratio, yeah, of what color, what amount you use to mix it. So it's going to be different for How everybody. Do you mix the turquoise blue again? What? The turquoise blue, light blue. Mm -hmm. How do you make that? How do we make turquoise blue? So uh, add more water to dilute it, but I also like to create kind of like a sea foam ish color the sea foam is very beautiful it's not it doesn't compete with let's say especially when you're doing the background color um, so I usually take the light blue and then add a little bit of green to create like a sea foam color and here you can see my palette here it's more like teal looking so you know you're going to take super light blue super light green and mix together and um, you're going to get shades like this Let's see if I can get it on here. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to put it on. You see that? 
Oh, wow. You see the color? Yeah? yeah. It's, it's nice, like neutral shades that can be really good for background, whether, whether you do Bird of Paradise, Mandala, or even yeah, on the succulent piece. And you could get darker sea foam, more like a, a sea glass or teal, if you add darker blue and darker green together. It really depends on, you know? what ratio or, or how saturate the two colors that you mix together. I'm going to, um, once I finish this, I'm gonna let it dry. And then I'm going to guide you guys how to create the soda ash solution, okay? The soda ash solution is that white powder that you see yeah, in that bag. And um, it's very easy to use in order to create the soda ash solution that you need in order to fix the color so the color stay permanent on the fabric. So I'm almost done here. See, it's not the same when you're painting and you're rushing. <laughs> so I hope, yeah, wherever you are, whatever stage you are, don't rush, yeah? Just take your time. When you're done, you're done. You can, you know, have the colors, sit on the palette, and then on the weekend and you have more free time, you can continue, yeah? All right, so here's my piece. I want to let it dry because I'm going to iron this to show it to you guys. So it's going to go outside for 10 minutes. So while we wait for the piece to dry, I'm gonna show you how to make your soda ash solution. You may wanna take a little break and pay attention to this one, yeah? Because uh, you know I don't want it to be confusing for you to continue. So here's the soda ash, yeah? Soda ash is uh, not much, maybe about one full tablespoon. You are going to dissolve the soda ash powder in about a quarter cup of water. A quarter cup of water is so little. It's like in this jar here, it's like maybe one third of, uh, you know, and then you're gonna dissolve the whole packet. You're gonna create a soda ash solution. That's what we're doing here. Stir it with a brush. Yeah, My brush here has a little bit of pink in it. So my soda ash solution has a little bit of color in it, just a little bit. So you want to create a soda ash solution just like that, okay? Dissolve the entire packet of soda ash in a quarter cup of water, very little, a quarter cup, that's it. You want the, soda, the solution to be highly concentrated. Now we get to learn a little bit of chemistry. This is a pH test paper, <laughs> just like we did in a chemistry class, yeah? Now, if I were to take this strip here, and test the alkalinity of this solution here, it's gonna be very high. So now you know a little bit about soda ash. Yeah, it's highly alkaline. So the pH is like about 13 or even maybe 12 to 13. And that's the level of concentration or concentrate or, or saturation that you want in the soda ash solution. So that this year, is going to yeah, activate the pigment that you put on the fiber. So that way the color will bond. So the color will not leave the fabric. So let's see, here's a piece that I finished, yeah, with the Bird of Paradise. What are you gonna do is after you finish painting your piece, okay, pay attention to this part. Okay, this is kind of important and how you wanna finish this project. Um, Make sure your piece is completely dry. My piece is dry, okay? Dry, so it may take maybe two hours to dry, yeah? This is a small, small piece, it's lightweight. 
And then I have my soda ash solution ready. It has a little, you know, a pink color in it for my brush, but don't worry. Yeah, yours should be okay if you use clean brush for this. It dissolves completely. Now you want to use your brush to apply the soda ash area per area, just like what I'm doing here. Okay. And then you can see not to smudge it. Don't smudge it. Don't dip the whole fa fabric in the soda ash solution. Yeah, you want to apply the soda ash solution area per area with your brush. Okay. And that's how you are going to fix the color. So the color stay permanently. Very easy. The whole packet of soda ash solution. Uh, dissolve it in a quarter cup of water. Uh, dissolve it completely. Okay, there's a chemical reaction that happened as we do this. So you need to know that, yeah? So not only does soda ash increase the alkalinity, but it also, in a sense, yeah, it kind of encourage the fiber to open up so the color can sit in in between the fiber, yeah? In, in, the, in the molecule or at a molecular level. So that's what happened. And this is how, yeah, batik is done traditionally. You have to fix the color so it stay permanent, okay? So if you do not want to make it washable, you just want to create a vibrant batik piece that you can display or put it behind in a, in a frame, you can skip this part. Throw away that soda ash, yeah? Don't use it, that's fine, yeah? Um, uh, just let your piece dry. And then we're gonna go into the wax removal part, yeah? And that's gonna be applicable to either you do a washable piece or you do a decorative piece. You're gonna need to know how to remove the wax from the fabric. Okay, now, one more thing that I need to highlight here that I think is important. Once you apply the soda ash on the fabric, it's very normal yeah, to see this. And I don't know, if this is done by an actual Airbnb client, which I'm gonna use this piece to demonstrate how to remove the wax. You can see the top of it, it's like a little white powder. Yeah, this white powder here feels like salt on the fabric. And that is what happened when the soda ash precipitate. When the soda ash, which is sodium carbonate, yeah, here it is in a solution form. Yeah? And here it is once it dried from the fabric, it leaves like a white powder like this. And that's absolutely normal, okay? Absolutely normal, don't freak out because once you put the soda ash, you're like, why do I have all this white powder? It's normal, it is what happened. Yeah? There's this chemistry reaction that happened. Uh, and then it precipitates and then it leaves that. And this is the reason why we need to boil the fabric. So it's like if I, if I take a summary of the whole batiking process that you learned today, like I hope you understand that it's like one way or the other. You can batik one way where you don't use the soda ash, but you have to iron the wax out of the fabric or you apply the soda ash to fix the color, but you must remove the wax with boiling water because this is not how you want your fabric to look. Yeah, once you apply the soda ash, you have to boil it out, okay? So those are the distinction between, you know, a washable piece and a you know, decorative piece. So, you know, you'll see a lot of decorative batik in countries like Africa. Yeah, a lot of the pieces are for display and you can see all this safari team, for example. But from my part of the world, yeah, or even in, in you know, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, all our batik pieces are wearable. Yeah, we wear it. This is part of our cultural heritage. But I think it's nice that you can make that decision depending on how you want to use this. You can use it just to display or you can use it as a little handkerchief. So that's the best part, okay? Now I need to show you how to remove the wax. So wherever you are in your painting process, yeah, let's take a little break so you can see how I remove the wax. Um, I'm going to adjust my camera so you can see my setup here. A few minutes to do that.
I'm going to do the boiling water first, Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Well, continue painting. I'm still, I need a couple minutes to set up, yeah? Well done. Okay, I'm gonna change my camera to the external camera here so you can see my setup. It's very simple. It always feel like uh, overwhelming to get to this part, but once you see how it's done, you'll be like, wow, it only take her yeah, five minutes. So you can see here, I have the iron. Yeah, this is gonna be for when I do the ironing. And you can see behind me, those are my collection of batik stamp that some are made for me, yeah? The camera. Or Wait, so you can put wax there. on those and then print on the fabric? Oh yeah, I, I teach a whole other class for that. Um, wow. In case if you wanna know a little bit more, something like this, these are made for me. Um, these are for the hand stamp class. So a hand stamp class is so different. In the time that we spend together to paint a small handkerchief, yeah? Here, can you see in a magic camp? Oh, I can, I can tilt it to here. You can see how, <laughs> let's see if we can get that image here. So uh, these are made from aluminum sheets, but the pricey one is made of copper. Yeah, these are a piece of art in itself. It is all made by hand. Um, mine, a lot of my pieces here come from uh, Pekalongan, Indonesia. Uh, these are all made for me, so I would send a sketch and then they're all put together this metal. Uh, to do a hand stamp is totally different setup than what I just showed you in the beginning with the janting tool. So uh, that I think will be for next class. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's so <laughs> but, cool, uh, thank you. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I collect them because I just can't get enough of, you know, what beautiful, um, you know, how, how beautiful they were, they, you know, people made this stuff by hand and how intricate and how hard it is to make one. Uh, all right, so let's get the setup finished here. You can see I have two bucket. I have two bucket here. Okay, I'm gonna try and get the camera a little further up so you can see. Don't mind about the iron. We're not gonna need the iron now. Yeah, so these are the two bucket in here. I have nothing here. Yeah, this is gonna be the hot water bucket. In here, I have the cold water already, the tap water. It's gonna be two rinse, hot water, cold water. So, uh, Jonathan just brought a little bit of detergent. So I'm gonna add a little detergent to my cold water. I'm gonna add a little detergent in this bucket here. Yeah, that's gonna be for my hot water. This is the finished piece for my clients. So now I have to remove the wax and then I send it to them. So what you wanna do is remove your piece you know, from the hoop and this is completely dried. And let's check so we understand, yeah? This one has the soda ash, okay? Because it has soda ash, it's precipitated already, it dried. Now I must yeah, boil the fabric to remove the wax. So Jonathan is bringing the boiling water here. Working with the boiling water is much more, <laughs> you know, uh, challenging than hot wax to be honest. So here's the boiling water. You can see me pour a little bit of detergent. It goes straight right into just like that. Okay. And now you can see some of the color leaves the fabric a little bit, but you'll see a lot of the color is gonna stay. Okay. Why am I agitating this with this whisk here? Because when I agitate the fabric like this, it encourages the wax yeah, to leave the fabric and also encourage color that doesn't bond successfully to leave the fabric. And that's what you see the, the wastewater like that. So now it goes straight into the cold water and see how quickly I move from, you know, it's just about a minute. And that's what you get. Okay, 
that's what you get. And then see how yeah, color stays because we use the soda ash and see how, yeah, now if I want to really clean the fabric properly, I'm just going to use the extra detergent that I have here. I can scrub it a little bit. So in my pencil outline that I do, that I used to do the tracing is all can be gone as well. Okay. It's kind of doing a little laundry, but it's very quick. It's like five minutes yeah? and you can get it done. So here's the piece, okay? You don't have to worry about color bleeding out and you can just hang it dry or you can iron this piece. So I'm going to iron this piece. If this is in a client's work, so I, I have to yeah, make sure that any color does not stay on it, especially in this studio. So, is there any yeah? like special detergent that you're supposed to use for that or? I use regular Tide detergent, yeah, um, regular one that I use, okay? All right, so now you're gonna to get to do the ironing method, which is even simpler than this, uh, much easier. So you can see how it only take me three minutes to do the yeah, um, boiling method. So I hope a lot of you will try yeah, the traditional way of taking, I think, to be able to have somebody that you can, something that you can wear and say, I painted this, right? Other than just displaying, I think that's, you know, beautiful. Okay. So here I'm gonna use paper towel. I put about maybe two ply, yeah, at the bottom. And I'm gonna have another one that's gonna be on top of the fabric. Oops, let me get the piece that is drying right now. I am in Florida, Miami. So whenever I put something outside, it takes so fast for it to dry. So I'm doing this design for one of the Ellie Cam program for summer. And uh, so this is gonna be one of the design that we'll do. So you'll see how you sandwich the fabric. Yeah? Your finished piece has to dry completely, just like just now, yeah? before you remove the wax. And I'll put another ply on top. Iron, how are you gonna do the setting? I use one of this old iron. So you might have iron that have the steamer feature. Make sure you wanna turn the steamer off. Okay, you don't want any water, moisture dripping on your fabric. And then as far as the setting, you're gonna set it up to the maximum. Uh, mine is always, you know, most iron is gonna be cotton or linen. And that's what you wanna do. I'm going to leave it a few minutes for it to get really hot. So the heat from the iron is one that's going to melt the wax. The wax get absorbed in the paper towel. Okay. And uh, even though I say there's one way to remove the wax easily, but the wax is never completely off the fabric. It gets spread a little bit. So the feel of your fabric may feel different. Okay, on a washable piece like this, it feels so soft. And I love how cotton feels, it's just amazing. And then on a washable piece, like let's say this, for example, a decorative piece like this, yeah, it feels more like a parchment paper. Yeah, it cut because some of that wax got spread out in the uh, ironing process. It's not 100%. Uh, out of the fabric because we iron it. So, uh, you know, I like how, you know, a finished batik feel the traditional way. I just love it. It's, it's so soft, the kind of fabric that, you know, we are using today. So now this is ready. What you want to do is just apply the heat over the fabric piece. Okay, so most likely you're going to get almost like an imprint of the design. <laughs> Yeah, uh, from the wax melting. And that's what I have here. So I hope you can see it a little bit better. Let's see here. Um, yeah, I think it's a little bit uh, too much glow or sun here. Let's see, you can, can you use your camera? Look at that. Huh? Look at that, like the, the color is, is, it looks so vibrant. 
like in, in actuality like this. So you can see how the wax is here. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Are you on your camera? One second here. Okay, and you see the wax here yeah? on the fabric a little bit. It's much harder to see, but you will get the, the wax will leave the fabric. Yeah. And then this is what you get and see how the color. Yeah? I usually like to run the hot iron just one more time like that really quickly. Yeah. Uh, you may want to do this with, you know, cover so your um, ironing board doesn't get messy, but uh, get how yeah? easy that is. And then you can display it and the color looks you know, much more vibrant, the heat does set up the color and make it look yeah, bold or, or, or darker than um, the washing. Yeah? When you wash with the boiling water, even though it's traditional, yeah, you may lose the vibrancy a little bit and that's very normal. Yeah? And that's just come with the process of you know, using boiling water. So like this year, it's still wet, but because the fabric is so small, I'm just gonna go ahead and iron this piece so you can see when the different, the red in this piece appear to be very nice. Yeah, it's very bright and I love it. And then the use of the blue and the darker blue, uh, it's okay. Yeah, I think having that, uh, the white outline yeah, is, is, is neat and you can see some of the details, okay? So that's the difference between yeah, the two process and the two ways to batik. And I'm just ironing it straight so that this piece is dried and I can just yeah, be ready to mail it out. Okay, so you can see the difference. Yeah, I can put it on my table here. There you go. <laughs> so any question before I go? Doing great on time, exactly 19 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're not peeling wax off at any point, right? You're just back into the fabric, basically. Uh, uh, repeat that again, Katie. So I, for some reason I thought we were going to be peeling the wax off, but that's not the case. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the wax, no, the wax has to be a melt. So yeah. it leaves the fiber. So yeah, boiling water is one way, which is very traditional, but you have to fix the color first. You have to make the color permanent first. And that's where you use the soda ash, okay? Mm -hmm. And then ironing, yeah, the heat from the iron can also melt the wax away, but it's not 100% because some of the wax is gonna spread across the fiber. So it, your finished piece feel a little bit like stiffer, compared to your washable piece. So your washable piece is something that you can wear, you can use it as a handkerchief and you know, you can show it off like, yeah, I painted this, isn't it beautiful, <laughs> right? And, and then this one is really for, for you to display, not for you to wear, because you cannot get water on this because water will just, you know, take away that color, okay? Let me switch my camera so you don't have to look at my iron. <laughs> <laughs> second all right so everybody can we have a, a look at your progress before we say goodbye if we can all hold it up maybe at an angle if you can i would love to see this is like my favorite part because i'm so busy looking down and now when i look up and i see your progress i'm so proud of you guys awesome and i see let me see jonathan can we get a group shot so that yay well, thank you guys. You guys did wonderful. And I'm having fun just checking out each one of your works. Yeah, beautiful blending. Great Whoa, team. Gosh, yours looks so good. <laughs> I pretty much <laughs> just knotted everything. Oh, oh, Ashley, how are you? So fast. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like I said, I just blotted it. <laughs> it I looks so good. Crush I'm me. Fun. Crush me, you, you did it beautifully. Thank and, you, uh, you know, and, and uh, congratulations to all of you. You've done your batik, you know, hand painted batik piece. 
and uh, it's such an honor to be able for me to share with the group you know creative group like all of you so uh, uh, now when you travel you look at a fabric you're like oh I bet that's fatigue <laughs> let me check it out <laughs> so now you learn more about you know uh, art. I had one last so, question you mentioned yes. that after we do this when once this dries we'll do the soda ash thing with water and yeah. when that dries, we'll put it in boiling water and wash it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you so, also said something about cold water, right? Uh, so you're going to do the, the, in two stages. First, you, you put your fabric in boiling water. Yeah. And then you add a little bit of detergent yeah, to help expel things that, you, you know, the wax and all that. You want a clean fabric. And then it, you rinse it in the tap water. Yeah? And you add a little bit of detergent even in the tap water. So that can allow you to you know, clean the fabric a little bit and, and get a really nice you know, clean fabric. So hot water first, about two minutes, not like a minute, like really quick. But the whole time you're agitating the fabric and then quickly, yeah, after you see all the wax, float to the top you can see it in the boiling water yeah and you can see some color uh, may leave the fabric a little bit but not too much and then yeah you finish it in the cold water rinse with a little bit of detergent and that's it and then you can hang it dry you can iron it yeah and then you have your complete hand painted batik piece and you should be so proud of yourself <laughs> yeah it, it's 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 it takes time to produce anything that's handmade. And, uh, and I know, you know, today, not only you learn about, you know, the world of batik and the tools and, and, and what you can do as far as designing goes on a fabric, it is, the, the possibility is, is endless. You can do so many type of patterns, images, whatever. And then you learn about the chemical process that happened. And then you are challenged to how you know how to manage working with fabric dye and fabric when it's so fluid and then you learn how to remove the wax and then you still you know if you're not finished you can still um you know you can just wrap your saran wrap to cover your palette your color palette tomorrow wake up and you can get back to it and paint and enjoy that process and and you know and treating it just as a little me time for you to just focus on details and, and just enjoy that. Okay. So Carson, I want to thank you for putting this together and thank you to all, you know, to uh, uh, designer team. And I, I, I really have fun with all of you. And thank one you. <laughs> all right. Yes. Um, so say we got paint outside of the lines how can we clean that up you mentioned bleach uh i will not recommend you use the bleach because it's very tricky you have to apply the bleach in, in such a delicate fashion with a brush slowly and then you know you let it sit there and then it will dry and just leave like a wide area but you have to revisit by adding color to it you can yeah, if it bothers you, you can, but that's going to be like going on a little adventure <laughs> because, you know, because the bleach does not ruin or take away the wax outline. The wax outline is going to be there, but it's just going to take the color out, but you have to revisit and repaint the area, okay? And then uh, for me, usually I try to use darker color uh, to, to make the boo-boo part of the art. <laughs> all right well try try either way and i think that will be something for you to experiment you know and and see what uh how you know uh, you can use the, the bleach as an option but uh be careful be careful okay don't drip it all over then you have to repaint everything <laughs> oh gosh all right ladies thank you so much and uh what a beautiful day yeah uh uh, you can follow me on, on social media. I am on Facebook, Instagram, yeah, as Taratai Malaysia. And I hope to see you perhaps in the future in one of my online classes.
Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you, you. thank you so everybody <laughs> thank, thank you all right. thank you all right have a good bye, afternoon everybody <laughs> have a good afternoon bye, bye.